Welcome to this episode of Consider It Black Lead. I am Kim, your host. And for those of you tuning in for the first time, Consider It Black Lead highlights films, television programs, and stage plays that feature African Americans up front and behind the scenes. We also discuss social issues as it relates to these programs and how they may or may not impact our communities. So thank you for tuning in, and we hope you continue to tune in each week. Today, it is my pleasure to highlight the documentary, Balloon Man. It tells the story of Bill Costin, the first African-American hot air balloon master in the world. Let's take a look at the trailer. If you had told me when I was a little boy that I would be a hot air balloon pilot, I would have thought you were crazy. Here I was, I made a touchdown in my very first professional football game. He was a great athlete and obviously a very good and successful balloonist. We all became very, very good friends. Ed Yost, people that were truly pioneers in the business. If you look around at the other balloons and the crews, you don't see people of color. I told Bill the only color that mattered to me was green. Anybody not helping need help. You have to have you. ice in your veins. You have to be fearless. You have to trust your instincts. This was out in rural Georgia in 1979. Door opened and out came running six white men running toward me. Everybody okay? That was quite a crash. I went, crash? If that's a crash, I'll do this again. Being up in the sky, and it's nothing but you, a basket, and an envelope, to me, that's the definition of freedom. We arrived alive. <laughs> Today, it is my pleasure to have the writer, director, and the daughter of Bill, Chantel Potter. Welcome, Chantel. Hi, how are you? Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, so you know I had to start off with H-U. Uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we are both graduates of Howard University, and yeah. is also the alma mater of our Vice President of the United States. Oh, so we yeah. have to give some respect for that before we dive into our, our program. So now that we've gotten that Absolutely. out of the way, <laughs> Chantel, why don't you tell our audience about you? Um, what's your background and how you got into filmmaking? Okay, well, you know, I, I say I've always been in front of the camera growing up, I was in theater. I'd, I'd go half a day to a performing arts school um, and, actually they asked me to pick a minor and when I was looking through the different minors I looked at TV production and I'm like okay you know I might as well get to know how things work behind the scenes as well uh, but at that time I was very focused on acting and theater um, but then when I went to college I decided to make film my major and so I majored in uh, television production minored in business and um, you know I, I just fell in love with filmmaking you know I love uh, storytelling I love writing directing producing everything behind the scenes and you know I, I got further and further away from acting and um, you know I, I just realized I enjoy coming up with things in my head and then seeing them through to the end. And it's a beautiful thing when you can just have an idea and and see it through um, through post-production and now even distribution with this new film, uh, Balloon Man. So it's it's been a very exciting journey. Um, you know, I've interned uh, in college at various places just to get a feel for what I liked, what I didn't like. Um, and then after college, I ended up working for um, BET and I was a news producer. So I was the producer to the White House correspondent. Um, and I, I worked in that position for quite some time and I, I really enjoyed it. You know, every day we were, it was a fast paced environment. We were cutting news pieces, you know, pitching stories in the morning and we'd see the, the, the story on the site by the end of the day. 
um, you know, in that role, I was also able to um, produce a lot of short form documentaries. Um, I was able to travel to South Africa and um, produce a documentary uh, on Swati Zalmini, which is uh, Nelson and Winnie Mandela, Mandela's uh, granddaughter. And so, you know, she walked me through, uh, you know, her hometown and, you know, where her grandparents lived and, and just really told their story from her eyes. And so that was quite the experience. Um, and at BET, I was able to pitch my own shows as well. So I was interviewing and, and hosting different uh, individuals on my show, uh, just talking about their stories. You know, I always want to highlight people in their best light and just tell inspiring um, stories. And so that led me to this particular project, Balloon Man. It's my uh, feature <laughs> debut <laughs> documentary. I'm so excited that... Uh, February 2nd is the release date and I'll be able to share this project with the world. I mean, uh, creating this store, well, creating this documentary, it's been such a journey and doing it, you know, on my father, on his life and working hand in hand with him on this film. It's just been a rewarding experience. Yeah. So at what point did you decide, I am going to do this documentary about my dad. I mean, you know, you have all this other stuff going on, a lot of, you know, food on your plate, so to speak. What made you stop and go, you know what, I want to tell this particular story and I want to share it with everyone. Right. Well, you know, my father, is a, uh, he's a storyteller in itself. So I grew up just listening to all the stories that he had, you know, from attending an HBCU, he went to um, Morris Brown. And really that influenced me. I Hearing his stories, I'm like, I absolutely have to go to an HBCU. And that's what led me to Howard. And so, you know, from his ballooning stories to his stories in the NFL, I'm like, dad, you need a documentary. And since I'm a filmmaker, who better uh, than to tell your story but me? And, uh, and so it didn't start off that way. You know, I always used to walk around with a camera. So I would just follow him, you know, up and down the East Coast, um, filming, you know, his different ballooning excursions. And then eventually when I decided like, okay, I think this is really turning into something. And we decided to, you know, start staging it and doing sit down interviews with different family members, crew, um, other balloon pilots and balloon enthusiasts. Um, that's when I really decided, okay, I'm going to make a film out of this. And, um, and yeah, here we are. We just received uh, <laughs> distribution from Gravitas Ventures. So we're very excited to partner with them. That is amazing. Uh, you talked a little bit about, you know, how you gathered the footage, but one thing that impressed me about the documentary, that it was just beautifully shot. And those, those um, visuals from the air were just amazing. Could you talk mm -hmm. a little bit more how you gathered all that footage? We've been shooting this documentary for, for quite a few years. And so, you know, when I started, you know, I was just going around and shooting, but a lot of the footage, and, and once we decided, okay, we're gonna make it a documentary, that's when I brought a, a director of photography on board and we kind of, said, okay, this is the look that we're going for. And so we tried to shoot the interviews, the main interviews in that same uh, respect. Uh, but I say my father started this documentary for me in the 50s when he took his very first <laughs> photograph of his grandmother and his little sister. I mean, he grabbed his father's super eight millimeter camera. And you know, when Martin Luther King Jr. passed, he went out and filmed the procession. Um, and so all of that footage you see in this documentary, all of those images, you know, it's not stock footage, it's footage that my dad actually shot, you know, throughout That's their amazing. childhood. And yeah. yeah, and to have all of that at my fingertips, you know, hearing the stories that he's telling and, and we actually have footage and Im images to illustrate that story. I mean, I couldn't ask for, <laughs> for anything more. Awesome. So your father was also executive producer on this. What was it like working with your father? Like, did you guys get along or did you have a difference of opinion on what you'd be in, what shouldn't be in? Tell us what that was like. Yeah, I mean, it was easy working with him. I, I say he's the most organized individual you'll ever want to meet. You know, and and he had all of this footage, all of these uh, images. So I can call him at midnight, you know, if I'm up editing late and I'm like, dad, I need a picture of, X, Y, and Z, you're talking about this in the film. Do you have anything? Within minutes, I will have that image in my inbox. 
And so, you know, it's just been a pleasure working with him. We, we didn't clash much at all. I mean, I think the biggest, um, you know, we, we were deciding what to title the film and the balloon man didn't come until later on. O originally it was titled something else. And I was like, balloon man, that's it. That's you, this works. And he's like, oh, I'm so used to the other title. But, you know, I thought that this was more catchy and it kind of, um, it really goes with the storyline, I think. Um, and, you know, some things that I want to do beyond the film, I think uh, Balloon Man was the perfect title for it. So yeah. it's just been a pleasure working with my father. I'm glad that we had this time, you know, to work together so closely. And to spend yeah, it, it makes together. it that, that more special. So tell us, is there like footage that you would have liked to go into the documentary, but for, for whatever reason, time, production limitations, you couldn't do. Because that's always a conversation I have with people who do documentaries. Well, we wanted to put this in, but we just didn't have time or, you know, share some of that with us. I mean, this documentary was three hours long <laughs> and I had to cut something out because, you know, there were so many different storylines that I was trying to uh, weave within. Um, and, and then there was a whole nother family aspect. So I think that there's, a longer film just that the family can watch and learn more about our history, about individuals and their storylines and, you know, why things worked out the way that they did. Mm -hmm. But, you know, on, on a commercial side, you know, we had to cut that, you know, we were like, what, what do viewers want to see, you know, balloon enthusiasts, um, people who are interested in black history or biographies, what is it that they would like to see? Um, and so, you know, I had to, you know, I, I couldn't be married to these ideas that I had and all of this, <laughs> these sequences that I ended up cutting um, because there were certain things, you know, even down to um, the storyline with my grandfather. And mm -hmm. um, eventually, you know, doing this film, my grandfather ended up passing. And I had a sequence in this the film that I, I thought was so moving and and I thought it would really contribute to the film, especially because my father said that his grandfather was his main inspiration. Everything he did was for his mm -hmm. father. And mm -hmm. so, you know, when I passed the film off to another editor and I was just like, it's three hours, no one cares, <laughs> cut away. You know, that was one of the sequences that, that, that was cut. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I was okay with that. I, I realized, you know, that's a different film. We could show that to the family, but like, what is it that people want to see um, when it comes to ballooning and, and my father's storyline? So, you know, it, it was it was difficult, but I, I was totally okay with it. I, I just wanted the best film um, at the end of the day. And it came out very well. I don't, when I saw it, I didn't feel like I was missing anything. So it was edited mm -hmm. perfectly. So when you showed well, it to your family, thing. Um, how did they react to it? And how did you introduce this film to them? Well, we actually had a family and friends screening in Atlanta, um, Christmas 2019. And the film wasn't at Picture Lock yet. So I, I used that screening to kind of get feedback. Um, just some unbiased feedback. Some folks, you know, that were there didn't, had never seen the film. They, they weren't in the film. Um, you know, they were friends of the family. And so, you know, when the, when the film was over, I passed out um, questionnaires and it had about 20 questions on it. It's like, what did you like about the film? What, you know, what do you want to see more of? What do you want to see less of? And so that was very helpful in shaping the final, um, the final film. But, you know, we, although there was some, you know, there were a lot of great um, points and, and I took whatever was a common denominator throughout the feedback. Um, but overall, my family was just elated. You know, they they heard about this film, but I don't know if they took me seriously as a filmmaker. But <laughs> once they saw it, they're like, oh, wow, this is this is an actual movie. Like we're in a theater, we're, we're eating popcorn. And I was really entertained, you know, by this film. Like I didn't even know that about my brother or my uncle. <laughs> wow, I learned so much. This is amazing. So, you know, overall, we, we experienced some really great feedback. And I was just thankful, you know, to have my father there in the theater with his family, you know, with people that were actually in the film and contributed to the film in that way. It was it was a beautiful evening. Oh, that's great. That's great. Um, talk to us about what was your funding process like? Um, I know you mentioned that you had a lot of footage. And I know when you do documentaries, licensing 
um, some footage tends to be expensive, but you know, just tell us what your process was like for anybody else out there who's interested in doing a documentary similar to yours. Well, I, I really did some um, crowdfunding in the in the very beginning, um, and a lot of a lot of what you you know we did in the very beginning was self funded. Mm -hmm. It's like we have a story to tell and. I mean, we don't have many resources, but we're going to do what we can do to make it work. So, you know, a lot of it was self-funded in the very beginning. And then I, um, I ended up getting uh, two grants. So I, I got a fiscal sponsor, two fiscal sponsors who, you know, oh, it was such a pleasure working with both of them. And so, you know, when people donated, they were able to, you know, write their donation off on their taxes. So it was another great resource that we were able to, um, to use when we were funding. Um, and then, you know, I had some wonderful um, people who really believed in the project and they're like, absolutely, you know, I love your dad. I believe in this project. I believe in you. And, um, you know, they gave pretty large donations. Um, and then toward the end, when I realized I need animation. You know, I have this vision and I don't have animation. Animation is, it costs, you know, even just for a few minutes. Um, so I decided to um, partner with Joe Young uh, and, and we threw a big fundraiser in Connecticut. And, you know, that really helped us get this project across the finish line. I know we had spoken um, because your documentary was in the Real Sisters Film Festival. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about how, um, when did you know your father was special? Because part of you getting funding and donations was based on the relationship that your father had with people that he used to give of himself. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Because that was really touching when we had spoken about it before. Oh, yes, absolutely. I mean, I must have called a thousand people and, and had conversations with a thousand people. And when making this film, I'm like, you know, the tagline is not all superheroes wear capes. And I'm like, because my dad is my hero. Um, but talking to other people, I realized that he has impacted so many other people. And, you know, the just the service that and, and him giving of himself him, his entire life and kind of in certain aspects spearheading these different things because he's a renaissance man so you know from ballooning to the black history exhibit that he has you know to when he was growing up he started a chess club and so at one point there were a hundred people that were part of his chess club and they would do different tournaments for good causes you know mlk day uh tournament um he had a social club at one point he was always kind of the center you know bringing people together and he loved for people to really have fun and enjoy themselves uh you know he doesn't take himself too seriously but he, he just he witnesses to people, he, he, he is of service to other people. And so when it was time to ask individuals to support him in this project, you know, hands down, they were, they were ready. So you had a, a, a series leading up to the release called Beyond Balloon Man. So why don't you tell our audience about that? Well, you know, it goes back to when I said the title of the film is Balloon Man. So when someone sees the, the poster or they hear the title, they may shy away from the film because they're like, oh, this is great, but I'm really not interested in ballooning. But mm -hmm. I wanted people to know that this film is about so much more than ballooning. And my father was so much more and is so much more than just a pilot. And so um, I created a four part series and it's called Beyond Balloon Man. It lives on the film's website, chantalpotter.com slash balloon man and YouTube. Um, so please check it out. Um, we spoke with <laughs> some really, really wonderful people. Um, the first the first episode, it's called Life After Pro Sports. So I sat with, you know, a few former pro athletes from NFL to the NBA, WNBA, and we talked about, you know, what happens after, you know, something that's defined you for so long goes away. What do you do now that your professional sports career is over? How do you move on? Are you prepared financially, emotionally, mentally? 
Um, and so that was a really good conversation. Um, the second one was with the best of the best balloonists. <laughs> um, you know, each one, I wanted to cover all aspects of ballooning from special shaped balloons to gas ballooning. You know, we had a woman pilot on there. We had my dad. So some of the pioneers in the industry, I wanted to speak to them and talk about, you know, some of their experiences and some of their challenges in ballooning. Um, the third panel, was on you know black history black excellence black legacy and so i sat with some educators senator douglas uh mccrory was on the panel he actually uh worked on a bill so by 2022 in connecticut uh it's mandated that there is a black history course in all of the curriculum statewide and so he talked about that initiative we had the social media um strategist and and special assistant to the president of the NAACP. His name is Gene Brown. Uh, he spoke to a lot of the initiatives that they're doing and a very talented uh, musician and educator, Contavious Jones, spoke to some interesting uh, projects that he's doing on the Eastern Shore because there's so much black history on the Eastern Shore uh, from the Underground Railroad. So he, he spoke to some of the initiatives that he's working on. And he actually did an original song for the film called Sweetest Sky. And that actually plays during the sequence where my dad had his Super 8 camera at the MLK procession. So uh, the last panel is called Daughters of Men. And so Rachel Vassell, who's the author of that book, Daughters of Men, you know, she talked to myself and then two of my sorors just about our experience as daddy's girls. And, you know, we talked about heroism and, and how our fathers influenced us. Uh, and so it was just a really fun series. It's just an extension of the project. So if you have some free time, go check it out. It will live in perpetuity on the website. So whenever, you know, the, once you see the film, if there's some additional content that you want to check out, please go ahead and do so. Who are your influences in the business? Oh, so many. I, I pull <laughs> from so many different individuals. Um, you know, one person who I say helped me finish this documentary, um, Ken Burns. Uh, his, Ooh. he is, I, I purchased Masterclass and I've been watching, you know, different Masterclasses from Martin Scorsese to Ron Howard. Ken Burns really stood out to me though, um, especially because I was making a documentary. And he talked about just his experiences from his first film and all of the, the challenges that he faced, you know, just from living in New York City, he had to move away, you know, because it's so expensive. And, and when you get into filmmaking, sometimes you just need to humble yourself and, and get your project done. Um, and so, you know, he's a really big influence. Uh, Ava DuVernay, <laughs> a huge influence. I've been following her career since, you know, I will follow her first film. I was at the uh, uh, ABFF in Miami. I think it was like 2009 or, or something like that. And I saw that film and I'm like, she is something special. And just seeing her career unfold, and the types of films that she does, it's not just one thing. It's not just, you know, documentary or scripted. You know, she she has this array of, and that's her distribution company name, yeah. but she has this array of, of work under her belt. And that's what I strive for. Um, Shonda Rhimes, an, an amazing writer. I mean, she just motivates me. And, and watching her masterclass, I just, I was just energized and, and ready to write. Um, so those are a few of my influences, but I, I take bits and pieces from diff different individuals. Yes, those are amazing people, good influences. So um, what advice would you give someone just starting out who's interested in doing a documentary, interested in getting into filmmaking? You know, what advice would you give based on, you know, your experiences and things that you've learned? Well, I would definitely say collaboration is key. You can't do anything by yourself. And, you know, I tried to learn every aspect of filmmaking just so I, I knew what I liked and what I didn't like, but I will leave it up to the experts, you know, to help bring the project to where it is. So I will work with, you know, a wonderful editor or a colorist or some, you know, musical artists to, to create 
a masterpiece. I won't try to do it all by myself. So that that's a big piece of advice. I know sometimes, and especially during COVID, you're kind of isolated and you're kind of in your home trying to figure out how you can get back out there and collaborate with people. Um, but you know, it starts right here. You know, write your ideas down and and see how you can get creative, especially in this day and time. Um, I'd also say you have to stay persistent. You know, you'll get so many no's, but within that, someone will say yes. And, and, and if someone says no, just move on to the next door. Maybe it wasn't meant to be, but it, it's all in God's timing and things will, will unfold exactly how they should. Um, and then last, just, just try to talk to people who have been there. Don't reinvent the wheel. Um, there's a lot of things that I wish I would have known when I started this project. I think it would have saved me a lot of time money, resources. So, you know, but I didn't have that at my fingertips. And, and so search for that, you know, ask people who have done this before, you know, what was your experience like, or what should I expect, you know, especially with delivering the film, I had no idea what to expect, but now I know how to deliver a film. And, um, and that's big. That's, that's huge. The delivery of the film and all yes. of the, the laundry list of things that need to happen before this film can reach people's homes. Uh, if you know that process, you have somebody on your team who knows how to get you through that process, it will make your life so much easier. So in this pandemic environment, what is Chantel watching? What is she streaming? <laughs> My husband and I have been binge watching Shameless. <laughs> so that show is wonderful. I had seen one episode like a long time ago, but I didn't really get into it. But since we've had all this time, we binge watch. I think it's like on its 11th season now. So we've just caught up. And that's a really good show. Um, Bridgerton with, you know, Shonda Rhimes is a EP on that. I was like, oh, I really have to check check this out. And, it, you know, she's got my attention, you know, as always. Um, but we also like comedies. Any stand-up special that we can get on Netflix. Uh, we have a really good friend who's a comedian, so we'll just, you know, stream his shows and, and things like that. But uh, yeah, those are, those are the shows that I'm pretty much watching right now. Chantel, we are running out of time, but why don't you tell our audience where they can see Balloon Man? Absolutely. Well, Balloon Man is streaming everywhere on Video On Demand. So Comcast, Verizon Fios, Amazon Prime, Apple TV, iTunes, YouTube, wherever you can stream film, you can see Balloon Man. So uh, please check it out. Uh, live tweet me, Beyond Balloon Man, uh, hashtag Balloon Man movie. Tell me what you think about it. Well, there you have it, Balloon Man. You know where to find it. Make sure you support it. And until next week, consider yourself blacklit. Thank you.